He's the father of mandatory minimums. Like, subscribe, share with your friends, and comment, or you'll be visited by a reptilian hybrid from the Rockefeller Foundation. Mein Gott. Hey, ladies and gentlemen. The channel's growing. We're going to talk about criminal justice reform. But before I get started with that, I'd like to thank everybody who subscribed, the people who are joining the channel, the people who are go to, going to the Patreon site. And just a quick update, starting next week, I'm going to start posting daily on Patreon and for members-only stuff. And it'll be shorter videos. Some of them may be longer, but it'll be me venting or brainstorming or it'll be a little more graphic and with a little more candor. And most of the people who have joined so far know me, so they know that my language is usually far worse than what I say on here. So you may hear some of that, but hopefully you'll be okay with it. Now, criminal justice reform. My exposure to the criminal justice system is a little bit different. I spent some time in youth detention as a teenager. I watched my uncle, who has had addiction issues for basically as long as I've known him. From the time I was, say, 13 years old up, and it started when he got injured. And I've watched him go down a slope, and he's still alive, by the grace of God. And I love him to death, and regardless of what drugs have caused, he's still the same good-hearted person he was. But he is truly the representative of why we need criminal justice reform. And after being a juvenile delinquent, I also worked as a corrections officer after I retired from the Army. <laughs> I was an officer, I was a sergeant, I was a member of the Corrections Emergency Response Team, and spent a lot of time while I worked there in segregation, it was actually my preferred place to work. And if you don't know, segregation is what some people refer to as solitary, and the prison I worked in, the segregation house had people who were under investigation, one guy in particular was in there basically for protection because he had a hit out on him from the streets. You had people who had committed violations inside the institution itself. You had suicide watch in there. You had people under investigation, and it could be for something that was heard over a phone call. It could be suspicion of drugs, suspicion of weapons, gang activity, or they were being investigated either as a victim or a perpetrator for the Prison Rape Elimination Act. And then you had the PCs. They were the people that were scared for their safety. They had ratted somebody out and were scared to walk the yard. Some were just scared to walk the yard, period. And then you had a lot of people there for, how can I say this and still say monetize, for violating others. And instead of walking the yard, most of them, as soon as they get to receiving, they'll say they fear for their safety, and they'll write a statement, and they'll go to protective custody, which is PC. Now, working in the prison, you, you see some things that are really depressing. You'll see a 18, 19, 20-year-old kid who got busted for having marijuana, which let me caveat this with saying I fully support legalization of marijuana. So that'll temper some of what I'm saying here for some of you so you'll understand. But they got caught. They ended up on probation. They violate probation. Then they get caught again and violate probation. Then finally they violate probation because they get caught again with marijuana and they end up having to serve time. You have many, the stats are varied, and I couldn't find a consistent stat anywhere. So I'm going to go with the stat I learned when I was in the Corrections Academy, which is at least two-thirds of those in the Missouri State Prison System would benefit from true drug rehabilitation or mental health care, because that's the underlying condition of why they commit the crimes they do. Now, the prison I worked in, I can say this, so anybody that's watching this that worked in the prison I did, whether you're an offender or a former corrections officer, 
or support staff? Yes, I do think from a mental health standpoint, from going to classes with people in other institutions, I do think we had a good mental health department, or as good as we were going to get in the state of Missouri. And I learned that going through training with other people. But the problem with criminal justice reform is everybody wants an easy answer. And you know you think we have the, fault, the first female of color as vice president. We have the most progressive president in the history of America. So we should see criminal justice reform, right? He's the father of mandatory minimums. The problem with criminal justice reform is the way people look at it. You have people who want to close down prisons and release everybody. Well, I'll tell you, somebody who worked there, there are people who belong in mental health institutions and good ones. There are people there who need to go to drug rehabilitation as opposed to prison. But there's still some people that deserve to be there. And they are a hazard to society and the average person walking the street. But, as I said, do I think we're going to see it in the next four years? No, we're not. Nothing effective. We may see some stop gaps. We may see some feel-good things. But no true criminal justice reform that will do any good. And part of the fact is, or part of the problem is, everybody's looking at it with a very narrow focus. They're looking at it as a, well, we need to release them now. Well, we need to release nonviolent drug offenders. Well, if you look at, let's do a comparison to state and federal system. The federal system, and I'm going to look at the stats I got for this. So in the federal system, only 10% of offenders are there for violent crimes, whereas in the state, it's 50%. Approximately 16% are there for drug crimes in the federal system, and the state is much higher than that. But the federal system has more white collar, the people who cheated on their taxes, investment bankers that cheated their investors, things like that. Think of Bernie Madoff. Well, when you start talking about releasing nonviolent drug offenders, that becomes complicated too because if you're a drug trafficker and you're moving big time weight, you're moving kilos and kilos of cocaine or heroin or methamphetamines, yes, you may not have been convicted of a violent offense, but either you or someone on your behalf has committed violence to get you to that point, to that level of drug dealing. So no, I do think you probably belong there. Now, the 19, 20, 21 year old kid whose only convictions are for possession of marijuana or maybe smaller amounts of methamphetamine or heroin, because let's face it, heroin and fentanyl are killing our kids left and right. They're destroying communities. And like my uncle, many of them, many people discover heroin and fentanyl from a legitimate accident he had. And it started with pain medications. And we're going all the way back to the 1980s. So yes, it was during the crack epidemic, which is when our current president in the early 90s sponsored the crime bill, which led to mandatory minimums. And we had the vice president who, as the attorney general of California, kept people in jail when they knew they were innocent so they could fight forest fires. Now, are people like that actually going to come up with funding for effective drug rehabilitation and mental health? No, I don't think they will. So all these people that spout off about how we need to do this and how we need to do that, they're not going to do it. Don't hold your breath for them to do it because they are not capable of making it happen. On the other hand, if we as individuals use social media, if we work towards a common goal of effective criminal justice reform, then we can save the ones that still can be saved. But we also have to look at education, mental health. How do we fix broken families? That all feeds into the criminal justice problem we have now. It's not just the police. It's not just prosecutors. And you can say what you want about public defenders, but in some states now, public defenders' offices are repaying student loans for law students. So you know what that means? There's competition to get into those jobs. 
programs like this will make it better. In Springfield, Missouri, and in San Diego, California, they have what's called a homeless court. And it's a treatment court. Because one of the problems with the homeless is they get arrested and have a fine. Well, they can't pay their fine because they're homeless and don't have a job. So they get rearrested at some point for something else, trespassing, something minor, shoplifting, and they go back into jail and are convicted of something else and get another fine. Well, these keep building up. Well, in the treatment court, there's alternative means to work away these fines. These are the things we need to think about. We need to be inventive. And it takes more patience, and it takes more time. And at times, it can be more expensive. But let's actually treat the underlying issues. And if they're a straight criminal, if they've committed murders as a gang member, then in my mind, there's not a whole lot we can do for them. So fine, we'll warehouse these people. But the ones we can fix, let's start working on fixing them. And let's look into the future by investing in education for these kids who are coming out of broken homes because statistically, they're more likely to offend. So let's look at it holistically. And let's be prepared to spend the money we need to spend. Just some stuff to think about, ladies and gentlemen. If you like what I have to say, like, subscribe, comment. If you disagree with me, then tell me in the comments what you disagree with and hit dislike. We can have a civil discussion about it. You can change my mind, because I'm fairly open-minded, and I'll listen to new input. But I could change yours, too, if you actually are open-minded. Everybody have a good evening.